The scene that we have in the Torah portion today, Exodus 24, is pretty amazing. People make, I should say liberals, make uh, fun of it. They say, yeah, right, like there was some mountain and Moses went up and saw God and, and all of this, all these things happened. Uh, they say that this could not have happened. It's too fantastic. It's too apocalyptic. It's too uh, whatever. <laughs> so they say that it was uh, made up by jo uh, Josiah, uh, at the time of Josiah, to try to get Israel back to where they should be after the exile and so forth and so on. It's amazing to me that liberalism in that sense, in in disregarding or trying to tear apart the Word of God still remains. I guess it shouldn't be amazing to us because that's the enemy's, uh, that's his point, is to try to take away the Word of God. As I've said before, from the very beginning, what was the first thing that Satan said to Adam and Chava? Did he say? In other words, questioning the Word of God becomes the basis for temptation and ultimately for disobeying him. Sometimes be honest with yourself, be honest with ourselves. Sometimes when we think about all of the wonderful things that the scriptures talk about, the miraculous things, we say, did that really happen? Did Yeshua all of a sudden just start going up in the air? Was Yeshua the result of a virgin birth? I remember in Israel, as I said before, I, I, you know, I talked with people and they mocked me. They said, you can't be that stupid to think that a virgin will get pregnant. You know where it all comes back to? And I see this more and more and more and more when I talk to people. They are persuaded that there's no need for a creator because they've been taught and they've believed that somehow, out of nothing, came some big bang that started this whole thing and then it just evolved and evolved and evolved and evolved and Christianity is just another one of the pagan religions or they wouldn't say pagan just another one of man's religions trying to make sense of things that the scientists have now proven well anyone who believes that something comes from nothing hasn't listened to a song that was made famous some years ago <laughs> Nothing from nothing is nothing. And if you take away creation, what do you have? You have something you've made up. This is why I think the work that Spike's doing and others with him and like him is so vital to the gospel. Not just yesterday or the day before, but a few days ago, talking with someone, I, I, I asked this person, do you really believe that the universe never had a beginning? They said, no, of course, we know it had a beginning. There's scientific proof it had a beginning. I said, well, what was that? It was just a colliding of energy. So where'd the energy come from? It was just there. So, wait a minute. Where did the energy have its beginning? I didn't take that long. I said, there has to be a beginning when there was nothing. And the only way that that could have happened, what we have now and know as the universe, is because God spoke and it came into being. And the God that spoke and it came into being is the God we worship. If God can speak and there was life, if God can speak and there was light, then certainly God can do anything and all things according to his will and purpose. It's God the Father who sent his Son. By the way, who created everything? Was it God the Father or God the Son? Yes. You're right. Do you know that in some of the uh, Messianic uh, communities, that's a big challenge? It's hard to believe. Well, the God that we are talking about and the God that we know personally because his spirit dwells with us and in us 
And the God who hears our prayers and the God who answers our prayers is also the God who made a covenant. He made a covenant with a nation that he redeemed, that he redeemed from Egypt with an outstretched arm, with mighty, mighty miracles. And I've watched a video that uh, someone presented back at the ETS meeting some years ago where they, uh, it, it actually he did something which, which was technically illegal but not against the law of Egypt apparently. He was there, uh, he's an archaeologist, and he had one of those pens in his pocket that he could uh, take pictures with. And they let him and a few other archaeologists into a part of one of the pyramids that were just being excavated and just being discovered and opened and so forth. And he saw and he shows pictures. He's not yet published it. I have asked him several times. He says, I don't know that I have permission to publish it, but I have a picture of it on my computer. There is a, uh, a picture in one of the tombs of all of these Egyptians floating in the water with their chariots and horses. Now why would that be in a pyramid? Unless that was some part of history that they were trying to say, but we still survived, or something. Well, you know what? That picture predates a whole lot of later history. <laughs> to think that someone made that up and put it into the Bible is just crazy. God, with an outstretched arm, brought Israel out and brought Israel to Sinai, and that's where we are in our text. It contains the wonderful and mysterious account of the actual enactment of the covenant made between God and Israel at Sinai. You know, in our liturgy, we say, for the sake of our fathers. We say, you know, bless us for the sake of our fathers. Now, typical... Orthodox Jews would say that means that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had more blessing and more, they had more good works than they needed. They had plenty of good works to get them in and they had more than they needed and so they give some of it to us. Well, that's not what we mean when we say that. When we say for the sake of our fathers, we mean for the sake of the covenant that you made with our fathers. And this is when, when people... They don't ask this question. I've asked people, what does it mean? Why does Paul, why is it so important in Paul in, the, in his epistle to the Romans that he says that Abraham is the father of us all? Isn't he, Abraham just the father of Isaac and Jacob and Jacob's the father of the Jews? And All believers are sons of Abraham. And why is that so important from Paul's perspective? Because the covenant that God made with Abraham is the covenant of which everyone is a part who is in the Messiah, Yeshua. What was the promise made to Abraham? In your seed, all the nations would be blessed. Now, the covenant that we're talking about today in, in Exodus 24 is what we call the Sinai covenant or the Mosaic covenant. It's the covenant made with Moses and with Israel. It's the covenant where the Torah was given. Now, if we're part of the covenant that God made with Abraham, whether we're Jew or non-Jew, are we also part of the covenant that was made at Sinai? Yeah. Absolutely. You say, well, it says that it was made with Israel, precisely, which is why Paul, a few chapters later in Romans, makes a big point of the fact that we're grafted, everyone is grafted into Israel, whether it's a natural branch, which was broken off and grafted back in, or a, a, a wild branch, right? What is that tree in chapter 11 of Romans? It is the covenant promises of God. So this has always been God's plan. Isn't it amazing that a lot of our good brothers and sisters, and I believe they truly are brothers and sisters in the Lord, but they would say, no, we have no part in the Mosaic Covenant. Well, if you have no part in the Mosaic Covenant, then, <laughs> then there's a whole lot of things that are no longer required and are no longer the righteous ways of God. I was talking to someone and asked, you know, he said, well, we don't need the Old Testament, we only need the New Testament. I'm reading a book right now called, the title is, very caught my eye, The Old Testament is Dying. And um, 
the, the byline underneath the title is a diagnosis and a remedy. In other words, he's not saying that he's happy that it's dying. He's showing all kinds of statistics that the majority of people, that means more than 50%, who are regular churchgoers that were surveyed in these surveys, really don't have a clue about the so-called Old Testament. Very seldom preached from, less than 16% of the sermons on Sundays are being preached from the Old Testament, according to this survey. Well, if you don't have the so-called Old Testament, you can't understand the New Testament. The remedy is, yeah, well, yes, the, re the remedy is obvious to recognize that apart from the foundation of the Tanakh and the Torah in particular, there is no good way to explain what God has done in the apostolic scriptures. What's the need for redemption? What is redemption? Well, that's what we're talking about in these pivotal passages. God and man sit at table together and commune in the context of holiness in our text. Here we see the goal, the goal of redemption, the very purpose for which Israel was redeemed from Egypt, even as the Exodus forever forged the paradigm for redemption. So this covenant ceremony establishes the paradigm for the very purpose of redemption, that is, the reestablished fellowship of God with his image bearers. From the point of his banishment from the Garden of Eden, an estrangement existed between God and man. Granted, the covenants made with Noah and the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob strongly indicated that God's purpose was to repair the breach which sin had caused and to restore fellowship with mankind. Yet, it is here in the enactment of the covenant with Israel that the means of such restoration is revealed. Obviously, God remains holy and unchanged by the sinfulness of man. How then can fellowship be restored? seeing that man had become unholy through willful disobedience and the sin that had pervaded the race. Can you see why this perspective totally wipes out the idea of salvation by works? You know, it's, it's like someone who has a, an incurable disease and you say, well, heal yourself. What's the incurable disease we have? The sinful nature. Well, the answer to all this is found in the cleansing of sin through the death of an innocent sacrifice on behalf of man <clears throat> and through the mediation of this atonement by a mediator. All of this is dramatized in the awesome events of our prashah. I want to show how our text today models the tabernacle and ultimately the temple. Why did God give the tabernacle in the first place? We're still coming to that in Exodus, right? Where he's giving us all the all the uh, specifications for, for the, uh, the tabernacle. Remember the movable temple. So he could dwell among us. So why couldn't he just dwell among us? Why couldn't he just do it if that's what he wants? It's because he is infinitely holy. And he cannot dwell in the presence of sin. You say, well, then how does the Spirit of God dwell within us now? It's because in God's eternal court we have been declared righteous we're in the process of becoming what he has declared us to be but he has declared us righteous that's what justification is justification means that the judge has said not guilty now you say well wait a minute Tim but we're still not there yet you're right but does God exist in time well the answer would be yes I suppose if you want to say so, but in another way, God exists out of time because he's eternal. Everything is the eternal present for God. He doesn't have a before and an after. He's always been. I know that's impossible for us to contemplate. He dwells with us because what he knows he has made us to be and we will be, and for him we are. Because he's working that out for us. We are becoming more and more and more like him. And you say, wait a minute, Tim. There's times in my life where I've taken two steps forward and ten steps backward. Okay. He, whom the Father loves, he disciplines. We start walking back into the old ways and what happens? We get heartburn. We get all kinds of problems. And finally we cry out to him for help and he says, oh, you're ready for me to help you now? Okay. 
confess, if we confess our sins. Right? Isn't that the process that we're in? We're in this process of becoming more and more like Yeshua. This is why we hate it when we do those things which we know we would rather not and should not do. So the events of uh, our Prashah clearly portray Mount Sinai as the model after which the tabernacle or the Mishkan, eventually the temple, the Hekal or Beit HaMikdash in the rabbinic language, would be constructed. Okay? So you've probably seen these kinds of pictures somewhere on the internet where people have made these models of, of the tabernacle, right? Well, guess what? As you probably all know, but maybe some of you don't, and maybe there are some people watching online. I don't know if I put these up on the, on the uh, website so you can have the pictures. Basically, if we look from a bird's eye view, now we're looking down at the top of it, all right? There's this fence all the way around, right, with boards and sockets and so forth and so on, okay? So this is not to scale, by the way. Um, why? Why did there have to be a fence? Because there is a way only those who were clean could come in. That is ritually clean, right? There's a separation. What is the first thing God did in creation? He made it a separation. God is a God of separation. You can't have anything in this world if you don't have demarcation. We can't even speak. If all the words mean the same thing, they don't mean anything. Right? God is a God of language. God is a God of demarcation. And he says there is right and there is wrong. There is blessing and there is cursing. There is fellowship with me and there is no fellowship with me. And there's a division. Now, inside of that tabernacle, the first thing that you come to is an altar. Why is it put first? It says it's supposed to be close to the entrance. You can't get any, any further in without the, without the sacrifice. The sacrifice is the very thing that God requires. Why? The wages of sin is... So either I have to die or someone who is innocent dies for me and gives me his life. Now, if it's just one person who's innocent, which is no person that's ever been born in this world except for Yeshua, because we're all born into sin, right? So none of us are innocent. If I say, I want to give my life so you will have eternal life, I can't do that because when I give my life, it's for me. Because I owe God a debt of sin, which is life. There's only one person that could do that, and that's one who is infinite, and one who is infinitely holy. That he could get, make his life accrue to many. So we have the sacrifice. You see, that's what we have here in our text. What does he sprinkle all over the, the, the stones and everything? Blood. What does he sprinkle on the altar? Blood. Why is it such a bloody thing? The life of the flesh is in the blood. The blood is the very life itself. Ancient people knew that. God revealed that to us very early. So we have the altar where the blood was poured, where the animal was sacrificed. By the way, is the animal a sinner? No. No. No not created in God's image. He has a life, but it's without sin. But he only has one life. And that why you had to bring your own sacrifice. Did that really cleanse sins forever? No. What did it do? It pointed toward the ultimate sacrifice, which is why no one had to explain when John the Baptist said, Be, well, John the Baptizer, I know he was not Methodist or Presbyterian or Baptist, but John the Baptizer, Yohanan Hamad Bil, um, when he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Nobody had to say, what are you talking about? Everyone understood his language. Those sacrifices which had been done for centuries and millennia pointed to him. And he was the ultimate sacrifice. What's next? The laver. Who had to, what's a laver? What do you do in a laver? Wash your hands. Right. And your feet? And your feet. Okay, hands are a symbol of what? Your activities. Feet are a symbol of walking in this world. You get your feet dirty. Got to wash them. Get your hands dirty. Everything you do. Now, who used the laver? Oh, you mean the priests weren't 100% holy either? 
Uh huh. Okay. So then, there was the tabernacle proper. Okay. And it was divided. <clears throat> the first half was the holy place. The second, the most holy. Right. Now, in the holy place, let's remind ourselves, what, what were the three objects that were there? Okay, the table of showbread, the menorah, and the altar of incense. Okay, why do we need those? <laughs> what's the, what's the, what's the uh, uh, what do we learn from the uh, table of uh, showbread? They call it showbread, that's an old English. Uh, well, life, okay. We have it in our text. Well, could be that too, but what did they do when they got when when Moshe and Aaron and Nadav and Avihu and so forth, they went up on the mountain, what did they do? They ate. They had a meal with God. In the ancient world, how do you solidify and satisfy and seal a covenant? You have a meal. The priest represented Israel. They've come into the place where the very presence of God is. They eat the showbread. They have a meal. They're reenacting the covenant meal that is in our text. What's the menorah? Light. Let's see, was there another place where they had a meal and there was all kinds of light? Oh, on Sinai. Right? There was the glory of God. When Moses came down off the mountain... His face was shining. The light. It's the only light that's in there, by the way. They didn't have any kerosene lanterns or flashlights. They just had the menorah. So the menorah had to be burning how often? All the time. Yeah, every day. In the most holy place, what was there? The Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant had the covenant within it, did it not? And what else did it have? Some manna? And Aaron's rod that budded. All of the things that should remind Israel or were symbols of God's faithfulness to Israel. And where was the blood put? On the mercy seat, right? On the top. And what were statuary on the top of the Ark? Cherubim. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the cherubim were guardians of his holiness. So, when the cherubim look down, if they're to face down, looking at the top, what do they see? Blood. This is how the holiness of God is guarded in every way. Now, how does that work in terms of our text today? Well, anyone who was ritually clean from Israel could go into the tabernacle, right? Okay. Who could go into the holy place? Priests. Who could go into the most holy place? High priest, right. So there were 70 elders, right? Did they represent all of Israel? That's what 70 elders did. What did they do? They went to the foot of the mountain. There was Aaron, Nadav, Avihu, and apparently Joshua. Where did they go? They went on to the mountain and up to the mountain and up in the mountain. But Moses went into the very cloud. And according to what we read today, he went in there alone. Do you see the picture? This was the whole tabernacle is Mount Sinai. In fact, the tabernacle is a movable Sinai. It takes Sinai with you wherever you go. What is it? And where did God dwell? Yeah, the Holy of Holies, right? His glory was seen above the Holy of Holies, whether a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud. And it, said, it says in the text that he sat on the cherubim. <laughs> it doesn't really mean sit, but he, he 
abided over the cherubim. The very person of God having communion with sinful man through the mediator of a high priest. How often did they, did the high priest go in there? Once a year. Anybody else went in there, what happened? What does that tell you? There's only one and only one that can approach God in that way and secure our redemption. You see, back to what I was saying earlier. People have brought up this verse a lot to me. Why the law then? Or we could say Torah. Why do you even talk about Sinai? And it says it was added because of transgressions. Now how do most people interpret that verse? The reason that God gave the law was so that people would sin more. He gave them a law that they couldn't keep. And they knew they couldn't keep it. So when he gave them the law, he was, he was showing them again and again and again and again how sinful they were. That's what the law was for. To show everybody how sinful they were. In fact, if you read in the earliest, I think it's the first edition of the Schofield Bible. Anybody know about the Schofield Bible? Ever heard of that? Yeah. Okay. Well, it had notes at the bottom of the page. And it says, pardon me? It, it was helpful, but it was wrong in some places. On this verse, it says that the law was given in order to make Israel sin more. It's not a quote, but it's close. So that they would then say, I can't win my way to God. I have to accept him by faith. That's not what this verse means. For those of you that can read some Greek, there it is. But the word that I'm mostly concerned about is this word, which is translated because of transgressions, but it literally means for the sake of transgressions. Karen, or Charen, yeah, Karen. It's only used five times in the, uh, in the, in the uh, Pauline epistles. It's used elsewhere in the Gospels and so forth. But if you look it up in uh, Bauer, uh, Art, and Ginrich, and Danker, the major uh, lexicon, you'll see that the first uh, definition it gives is to define a goal, G-O-A-L. It often indicates the goal to which something points or proceeds. So I think we should not translate it because of, but for the sake of. Why then the law? Why then the Torah? It was added for the sake of transgressions. How is that? It is because the Torah gave us the tabernacle. The tabernacle gave us sacrifice the revelation of how God would deal with sin is given in the Torah. And that's if you read the rest of Galatians 3, that makes perfect sense. The Torah was given by God to show mankind the means by which he would reconcile sinners to himself. The sacrificial system, the priesthood, and all of the rituals in the tabernacle foreshadowed the ultimate sacrifice of Yeshua. Why does the writer to the Hebrews make it so much a point of that epistle that Yeshua is our heavenly, what? High priest. He expects that we understand everything that went on in Exodus. He is the one who has entered into the tabernacle not made with hands, right? There to appear in the presence of God for us. So the sacrificial system, the priesthood, and all of the rituals of the tabernacle foreshadowed the ultimate sacrifice of Yeshua. The Torah revealed the only way that God's infinite holiness could be satisfied and fellowship with his image bearers would be restored. So what does that tell us? It tells us exactly what we already knew, and it was this. Is this. Yeshua said it very succinctly. I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There's only one way, no other way. That's essentially what we have going on here. <laughs> you say, Tim, how did you get all that out of Exodus 24? Well, it's pretty easy. How is it that Moses can go up on the mountain and eat with God and it says they saw the God of Israel? Did you notice that? How can you see God and live? Precisely. And look at all the other scriptures which I have in your notes here. Um, oh, where is it? Um, on page 7, uh, the end of the middle paragraph there. People, the, I'm talking about verses 9 through 11. They contain a remarkable scene. Moses, Aaron, and his sons and the 70 elders ascend the mountain and see the God of Israel. We should also include Joshua in this group as the plural of verse 14 indicates. But Exodus 32:17 also relates that Joshua was on the mountain and high enough so that though he could not see the people, he could hear them. In other words, when they're coming back down, he says he heard the people and they were making merry and, and then they had made the golden calf, right. Um, that the, the idea that the chosen entourage saw the God of Israel has been variously explained. Generally, the rabbis suggest that they saw the glory of God, the Shekinah, or some vision of God like that which the prophets saw in their visions. Others suggest that by see, we should understand, gain a revelation of or come to understand, much like our English word see is sometimes used. The Septuagint felt the tension of this text, which plainly suggests that the invisible God is somehow corporeal and translates, and they saw the place where the God of Israel stood. The Targum, you know who the Targums are, the Aramaic translations with commentary. And they saw the glory of the God of Israel, and under the throne of his glory was the work of a precious stone. That's not what the text says. The Samaritan Targum reads, Yera, to fear, rather than Ra'a. Those two words are sometimes uh, confused because they look very much the same in various forms. And renders the phrase, and they feared the God of Israel, and there, where they met him, the ground was like a sapphire. All of these are attempts to explain the unexplainable. God is spirit, and no one has seen God at any time. And I've given you John 1.18, Colossians 1.15, and 1 Timothy 1.17. So who did they see? Did they see God? Yes. That's what it says. It clearly says in the Hebrew, they saw, the, they saw God. And how do we know that all of those other ideas can't be right? That they just saw the place, or they saw you know, a shadow, or they saw some glory. Because it says, and underneath his feet was glass like sapphire, or whatever you want to however you want to translate that. I believe this was a pre-incarnate physical representation of God in Yeshua. Is Yeshua the creator? Yes. It's hard for us to wrap our head around, isn't it? But hopefully it's not hard to wrap your heart around. I know head and heart are the same. But faith allows us to take hold of things that we cannot see. Allows us to know for sure things we cannot fully explain. How does our, how did the uh, Haftarah, uh, our passage from Isaiah, wasn't, isn't that a be beautiful passage? I believe it's, uh, let me look and see, I think it's, is it verse 11 of, 60, maybe I have it in the notes here. Um, let me look it up. If you have your Bibles, turn there to Isaiah. Um, Isaiah 60, 60, I believe. It's in there. It might be 61. Uh, let's see, 11. No. 61.11. No. Where does it say, and then, and all of Israel will be righteous? 
Yeah, 61 where? 6021. 6021, right. Okay, thank you. In Isaiah 60, verse 21, it says, Then all your people, and if you have an NESB, do you have will be in italics? It is in mine, at least. Any of your Bibles have italics for the words will be? Yeah, okay. Uh, because they're really not there, but I'll explain that in a moment. Will be righteous, they will possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. You know what the rabbis do with that? It's in Sanhedrin. Oh, I forget. I put it in your notes, I think. It's in Tractate Sanhedrin. Okay, in the context here, it's all in the future tense. It continues our future aspect. When you have in Hebrew a future aspect, future aspect, then there can be a time when the verb is left out because it just follows the verb from the previous uh, verses, the verb to be. So that's why your Bibles have correctly translated, all of your people will be righteous. But the rabbis say, oh no, it doesn't say that. All of your people are righteous. And so, basically, they're teaching in the Mishnah, uh, in, in not all of the manuscripts, but in some of them, that if you're Jewish, you're in. They get it from that verse. It's amazing. None of the other things in that chapter seems to have happened. <laughs> it says that all, they will possess the land forever. That hasn't happened yet. They've lost the land and come back and lost the land and come back. There's coming a time when they will possess it forever. That is throughout all the rest of Earth's history. So if you, if you are confronted with that, now you know, uh, chalk that down and, and remember that so that uh, if you come across that in the future, you'll have an answer. It doesn't say they are, it says they will be. Buzz. Oh, Mike Fowl. Is it fair to say this is during the millennial period? Yes, absolutely. This is a millennial chapter, no doubt. Yep. Violence will no longer be heard in the hall of the city. Devastation and destruction will no longer be within your borders. No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor for brightness will the moon be giving you light but you will have the Lord for the everlasting light. All of this is millennial future. This is, I believe, the text upon which Paul based his phrase in chapter 11, verse 26, I believe, of Romans, then or and all Israel will be saved. When the time of the Gentiles is completed, then all Israel will be saved. What does it mean? Does it mean every Israelite that's ever lived? No, it means that even today, as we can say, Israel as a nation is not a nation that has, as a nation, has accepted Yeshua. Many Jews have. Many people of Israel have. But as a nation, they, they have not. There's coming a time when Israel as a nation will. Zechariah says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him. Right? So that's a wonderful thing. It's a good passage to use, but they would say this is eternity. They would say it's not millennial, it doesn't have an ending. It just is, it's, it's the eternal state. There's a problem with that too. <laughs> yeah, okay, go ahead. Yes. Um, my question was just in regards to the, um, the phrase will be. Um, do we have any other instances where we have a because you said present tense being used in the context of everything else being future tense and that sort of inferring the future tense onto it? No. It, no? The, the only way you could tell is if verbs surrounding it were in the, in the uh, present tense. Okay. You would have to have a precedent verb in the present tense to then say this line without a verb to be is uh, present tense. Mm -hmm. In other words, all of the verbs uh, from 18, well, even before, but 18, 19, and 20, all of them are future 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or so do we have other instances where we see this same um, gram grammatical phenomena occurring? Oh, yes. We have that inferred future tense? Oh, yes. This is a common reality in Hebrew syntax, especially in poetry, and Isaiah is mostly poetry. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's a well-established uh, uh, axiom, yes. And the, and the rabbis know it. They're not, they're not devoid of their understanding of, of Hebrew. <laughs> it's just that they decided, well, since the verb's not there, we'll translate it present tense. All of Israel is, yeah. So how does the Orthodox Jews interpret Zechariah 12.10? Uh, they will look upon him who they pierced. They take that to be that they take the servant of the Lord in Isaiah to be Israel always. And they they and Israel is sometimes referred to as him. So they say they will look upon us who have been slaughtered, who have been, you know, Holocaust and all of that, and they'll mourn for us. In other words, the whole world will change their viewpoint towards us. Which is true. That, that's true. That will happen. But it's too obvious an individual. And it's too obvious an individual in Isaiah 53, which is a bugbear for them. Because it says, uh, he has borne our transgressions. So here you have a single individual who has borne our transgressions. You know, we we despised him. Those, I mean, it was it's very much us and this individual, and it's very clear. <laughs> so this is why many, uh, uh, from what I've heard and read, many uh, very religious Jews are warned not to spend too much time with Isaiah 53 because it's too easily misunderstood. They said. Well, last thing I'll say, uh, this whole idea then of Torah, it is foundational. It is foundational for all that we believe. And when you take it away, you give up something that is leads you down a slippery slope. And I will say this also. If we don't read the Tanakh, as pointing us toward Yeshua, we have missed a great deal of the Tanakh. From, Isaiah, from Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. We're looking all the way through and we think, well, maybe Joseph is the one that, you know, Joseph comes across and the story is like, wow, he's the guy. But he's not. <laughs> we come to Genesis 49 and it doesn't come from uh, the, the one that is coming doesn't come from Joseph. It comes from Judah. And it's, it's like, what? Joseph wears the white hat all the way through the last part of Genesis. He's the hero. He's the savior. But that's not where Yeshua comes from. He comes through the tribe of Judah. So we keep looking and looking and looking. And if we're not looking for him, we're going to misunderstand a good deal of the Tanakh. Now, I don't say that we should put him everywhere because obviously that's, that's not the point. Last thing I'll say is this. What does the word, we have the word uh, to atone in our text. What does atonement mean? Does it mean to cover? It means to wipe away. The older commentaries that you'll read and the older notes in your Bibles will read that it means to cover, that the blood covered the sin but it, it, this is a little technical. It means to cover in the, in the call stem of the Hebrew. That's what we read when it says that Noah covered the ark with pitch. It's the word kafar. It's the, it's the same verb. But then there is, an, uh, there is a uh, PL form of the verb. I know I'm talking technical here, but in, in Hebrew there are derived stems. So the same verb can show up in one of the various stems. Every time this word kafar is used in the PL, it means to wipe clean. And guess what? Every time this verb is used of sin, it's in the PL. It is by God's, by the blood, that our sins are wiped clean, not covered. Wiped clean, taken away, no longer there to be seen. So 
an amazing thing. So what's the bottom line? I, there was just too much to cover in this. We can go over more, but um, the bottom line is what God has given us on this, in this chapter, the very, the very meeting of a human being, Moses, a sinful human being, with him on the mountain and seeing him. And when he came down, his face was shining. Whose glory was that shining in his face? It was Yeshua. Paul makes that very clear in 2 Corinthians 3. You say we see the glory of God shining in the face of Yeshua. And just in chapter, uh, that's in chapter 4, but in chapter 3 before, the whole first part of that chapter is about Moses coming down. And by the way, it doesn't mean that he put it, why did Moses put a veil over his face? Because, his, because the glory was fading and he didn't want anybody to see it? That's what, that's what your Bible say. In, in, he, in 1 Corinthians 3, it says he put a veil over his face because that, uh, the, the glory was fading. But that's not what the Greek says. It says because the, the, the glory was taken away. In other words, he put the veil over his face so that the glory would not have its proper effect upon the people who see it. You say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it does. As mysterious as it is, God said, I will give them eyes and they will not see. I will give them ears and they will not hear. Lest they turn and repent and be redeemed. And why did, what does Paul then come to the conclusion in chapter 11 of Romans, why that happened? They were blinded so that Gentiles would see. And how does he end that? He ends it by giving us a complete, full explanation, doesn't he? Uh, no. He said, who can know the mind of the Lord? And who can discover his ways? For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. He's saying, you want me to give you an explanation for this? Why would God do this? I can't give you an explanation except for this. That everything God does is for his honor and for his glory. And will accrue to that. So does that mean that we can kind of sit on our hands, kind of just put our hands behind us and do nothing? No. What is the means by which God uses to bring those he has intended to save to himself? It is the gospel. We must give the gospel. We must be lights in this world. We must take what we have learned and know to be true and find ways to share it with others.